views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of the station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. of traditional talk people pontificating about this or that the left or the right sometimes the truth is just all lost in the noise having learned life lessons the hard way chuck gallagher international speaker and author cuts through the noise to share truth through transparency nationally known guests talk about what's important to you your life your concerns and your success so tune in turn on to straight talk with chuck gallagher now here's your host chuck gallagher Hi, this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio, and I am really excited. It's it's kind of cool whenever you get to, uh, in some form or fashion, participate in the launch of an outstanding book. Um, the title of the book is The Good Ones, and it's written by my friend Bruce Weinstein, and Bruce has joined us and I, I I bought the book. I downloaded the book. I'm a downloader, so I downloaded the book. I have um, Bruce probably gotten eh, two thirds of the way through at this point in time, and I've got to tell you, it is well written and really uh, shares some very very cool examples. So uh, first, I want to say congratulations on on writing the book and uh, and and your launch. It's it's an exciting time for you, huh? Well, thank you, Chuck, and I really couldn't have done it without you because oh. it was – no, really, because uh, if I didn't have so many great stories like the one you told me, uh, the book would have been about as long as the pamphlet that Julie Haggerty passes out an airplane. <laughs> well, Remember that? Yeah. Yes, I pamphlet. do. She was uh-huh. uh, passing out great Jewish sports legends and all of that, <laughs> which I can say because I'm Jewish, uh, so it's not anti-Semitic. But no, but because of stories like yours and Anne Zuccardi from NSA and uh, Alan Murray, the editor of Fortune magazine, just so many terrific stories about how character is the key to success in business and in life and how in some cases um, the lack of character has hurt businesses and the employees who um, fail to live up to certain standards. And your story was, I mean, as you know, because you probably read it by now, it plays a really important uh, point uh, in the book, in the chapter on honesty and how, as you say, every choice has a consequence. Well, I got to ask you first, the the very first part of the book talks about character and, and, and the missing link to excellence. And uh, Bruce, I really want to. I want to delve into first what motivated you to write the book, and then the second part of this first question is, and why character? It's uh, two great questions, and I'll tell you. Um, as you know, as an as a fellow ethics speaker, there are essentially two different approaches to talking about ethics: conduct and character, and um, a lot of what constitutes ethics reflection in our society focuses on puzzles to solve. It's sort of the Ann Landers approach to doing ethics. You know, I have this problem. What should I do? I was standing in line at Starbucks and I overheard two colleagues talking about confidential um, information. Should I say something or should I not? What should I do? And it's important uh, to look at these kinds of puzzles, but the moral life is much broader than that. And uh, in my previous book, Ethical Intelligence, I talked about how ethical intelligence means having the courage to be committed to living an ethical life uh, for the long haul. And one of the people who read uh, a version of that, a philosophy professor who read that book said, you know, you're talking about virtue, Bruce, but you don't really discuss it in, in any depth. And he was right. He was right. I, I did not talk about virtue at all. And so after I finished Ethical Intelligence, I spent a whole summer and I wrote a book proposal for a book I was going to call Virtue. 
And I mm -hmm. thought it was terrific. I thought, you know, CEOs and business leaders can look at character and how um, it's the missing link to excellence. But my publisher said after after he read the, the proposal, he said, I just can't see a business executive sitting on a plane reading a book called Virtue. And so he re he wouldn't even let me redo it. He said, "I this is just not a book we want to publish. And of course, I was uh, depressed about that. But upon reflection, I thought he's right. So I spent another year reworking it. <clears throat> and I, I remembered a long time ago, um, someone said to me, uh, Bruce, you're one of the good ones. And it was one of the nicest things anyone had ever said to me. And now this was in West Virginia. And uh, you're in, in South Carolina. Is that right? Jeff? That's right. Now, That's right. Now, is that a phrase that you hear a lot in the South? You know, he's one of the good ones. She's one of the good ones. You know, uh, in all honesty, Bruce, you, you hear it from time to time. But it, it really is a high compliment because I, as I walk around, I don't hear a lot of people saying that about anyone, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I, I only bring that up because I live in New York City now, but I grew up in San Antonio and – um spent a lot of time in Florida and then and West Virginia before that. But sure. this phrase, the good ones, stuck with me. And so I thought, what if what if we had a book called The Good Ones that looked at people of high character and how they play a crucial role in the success of a business? Right. And I came up with 10 qualities that are associated with high character people and uh, spent the last two years interviewing folks from all over the world. And uh I said, you know, I, I was having a, I was struggling at the very beginning of this book because it's such a daunting project. You know, where, where do you even right. start with something like that? Um, and my, the editor who had rejected the previous proposal said, Bruce, think of yourself as the host of one of the greatest cocktail parties the world has ever seen. And you're talking with all these fascinating people and you're listening to their stories and your role is to collect them and weave them together and uh, into a coherent narrative. And that was the key that unlocked it for me. So once I had that as the template, if you will, I was able to do focus interviews like the one I did with you. When did we do that, Chuck? It was at least a year ago, right? Oh, ab absolutely. At least a year ago, yes. So um, I've just lost all track of time with this thing. But um, I... And so every story serves a very specific purpose. And yours is about how an experience that you had at a firing range um, brought home, uh, as if you needed it to be brought home, the, the fact that, uh, as you say, every choice is a consequence. And in your case, a choice that you made decades ago still has repercussions. And uh, I, I don't want to give anything away because I would love for your listeners to, to read your story in this book. But uh, it's, it was a very powerful one. And I also talk about, as you know, um, the indelible impression you make as a speaker in what I think is one of the, the best um, ways to introduce a speech that I've ever seen. And I'd heard you that you did what I'm about to say, but I'd never seen it myself until last September. And that's how you start your talk in an orange jumpsuit uh, in handcuffs. You know, I mean, everybody who sees your talk, nobody will ever forget that. Well, I, I wish I could claim credit for the idea, but uh, <laughs> but, but, but I will say it, uh, it it is somewhat powerful, and of course, you know, it's been kind of helped along with Orange is the New Black as well. So, oh, that yes, that's true. <laughs> but then, how you you almost it's like a Houdini trick. Then you get yourself out of the jumpsuit and out of the uh, the handcuffs, and then talk about how it was that you psychologically made, you know, baby steps toward uh, uh, the, the decision that, uh, what, what, you know, led to your imprisonments. But, um, you know, in fact, you have spoken, you and I have spoken to the same clients, some of them. Yes. And um, I went to speak to the Montana Society of CPAs, and you had already spoken there. And I, I asked um, the client, uh, you know, how you received. And she said, Oh my gosh, it was fantastic. People are still talking about it months later. And I thought, I want to be that kind of speaker. I want to be like Chuck Gallagher where people are talking about it months afterwards. Uh, but so. Bruce, you, 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 you are, you, you, you just, you just, you're one of the good ones. Okay. <laughs> well, you're very kind, but I know that it, it really is funny. Um, that we're essentially competitors, you and I, but as, uh, as Don Vito Corleone, the source of all a great uh, ethical wisdom, 
told his son Michael, keep your friends closer and your enemies closer. Oh, you're not, not that funny. I consider you an enemy, but oh, you know, right. it really is value. And, and also, and our, our fellow ethics speaker, Frank Bucaro, uh, read the book and wrote an endorsement. So, you know, before, uh, you know, you and I became friends, I thought, why would I want to become friends with the guy who's essentially competing with me for the same talks? But it's such a silly way of looking at uh, the competition. And I don't even think that that term doesn't even apply, does it? No, it really doesn't. You know, the thing that I recognize and, and you um, you have done a masterful job on and, and I really, really, really want to encourage people who are listening to the show. We've got about three minutes before our first break, but I want to encourage people that are listening to the show to pick up a copy of The Good Ones by Bruce Weinstein. And the reason for that is because you have done a masterful job of weaving together real life stories, not just something, some fiction that's made up, but, but real life stories into the narrative to help people understand the value of being a good one. And well, you're and, very and, kind. And I'll tell you what, uh, as a, as a courtesy to you and to your listeners, um, I will send an audio book to everyone who writes to me, whether or not you order the book, uh, I don't want to make it a lottery, but if you uh, write to me at bruce at theethicsguy.com, I'll send you an audiobook. book. Uh, now, Bruce, that is an awesome offer. And for folks listening, bruce at theethicsguy.com, write him. Let him know that you've heard it on this show and ask for your audio book copy of The yes. Good Ones. Bruce, um, We've got a, a minute or two before our first break. Um, you told me about writing the, the the book and kind of what took you there. I'm going to assume this has probably been a multi-year process. Is that correct? Two years in the writing and a year to just write the proposal and get it accepted. Wow. So we don't have a lot of time before we go to the first break. Did you find it difficult to have people or get people to agree to participate? What I did was, Chuck, I, I have about 3,200 contacts on LinkedIn, and I wrote a personal letter to every single one. So that was wow. the difficult part, just the time-consuming part. And um, about, gosh, several hundred people said that they wanted to do it. And you know what? I, I don't know most of these people personally. I haven't met most of the people I interviewed for the book. But okay. some of them told me later they, they, they just felt like this might be something fun to do. And those people – who weren't really sure but decided to participate anyway, told some of the best stories. Oh, that is that is so awesome to hear. All right, so we're going to go to our first break. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. My guest is Bruce Weinstein. He has written the brand-new book, The Good Ones, 10 Crucial Qualities to High Character Employees. And when we get back from this break, we're going to talk about characters, character or characters, as the case may be, and if that's uh, a natural experience or a learned experience. We'll be back in just a minute. This is Chuck Gallagher. Stick with us. The book is entitled The Good Ones. It's written by Bruce Weinstein. He is the ethics guy, and Bruce literally is an international speaker on ethics and integrity. And in this particular book, he talks a lot about high character employees. In fact, he lists the 10 crucial qualities of high character employees. And so, Bruce, I'm going to ask this question because obviously now, um, Gosh, I don't know. I guess my first major indiscretion was back in 1987. Um, but obviously, I made a series of choices that ended me up in federal prison. And by anybody's estimation, that would be the antithesis of a high-character employee. Um, so I'm going to ask this question, and actually, your answer doesn't make a difference. It's okay. In, in other words, <laughs> what I'm saying to me, it's okay what you say. You're not going to offend me. Um, what didn't really come out right at the very beginning, but boy, not, you, I'm curious now. What this do you be. do you find 
that people of high character are naturally born that way, or is that a developed quality for people? It's a wonderful question, and what the stories that I've collected show over and over is that character is uh, a trait that can be developed just the way strength can be developed. And in fact, Aristotle talks about this in his book, The Nicomachean Ethics. That how do you, have you ever gone to a gym, Chuck? Sure. So yeah. before you start, now have you lifted weights? Uh, listen, Bruce, I have gone to a gym. I have lifted weights. I have found it to be one of the most boring experiences of my life. And so it's very boring. Now Jack my Lane, flabby self he, says, no. You know, Jack Lane talked about how much he hated it. Jack Lane, one of the, the greatest physical icons of the right. last hundred years, hated doing it, but he did it. And the, the a funny thing happens when you stop exercising after – uh, months and months and months of bodybuilding. What happens? You you start to lose all that great muscle mass that you've developed. Right. And it's um the one, another thing that comes to mind is why does Coke? Why do Coke and Pepsi keep advertising? They keep advertising because you think well everybody knows about Coke, but if they stopped advertising, people would would quickly forget about them. It's right. So marketing is something that has to be done consistently for it to be done well. Um, bodybuilding has to be done consistently for it to be done well. And the same thing with character, that um, we have to keep practicing being honest, being courageous, being fair, being grateful, because if we stop doing it, it's easy to lapse into old bad habits. So it is something that one can develop, that one can learn, that one can and should practice. And if we stop doing it, uh, we we fall back into patterns that, as Oprah might say, do not bring out our best selves. <laughs> you know, Bruce, I, I'm I'm kind of curious your perspective on this. Um, you and I both have the opportunity to go out into the world and to present at conferences, um, generally on ethics related topics. Um, most of the time, the the clients, a good number of them, will send me a copy of their ethics and compliance guidelines. The, you know, thou shalt nots of the particular business or thou yes. shalts, whichever. Yes. And, and I'm fascinated by the fact that so many people seem to be so focused on the rules as opposed to being focused on improving or creating character. Well, that's that's a wonderful point. And that highlights the difference between these two different approaches to uh, doing ethics that I talked about at the very beginning, namely conduct versus character. And a rules or principle-based approach to doing ethics is consistent with the, the puzzle approach to doing ethics. What should I do? And if you look at most of the, the rules and regulations and codes of ethics and so forth that companies have, they, they tend to be more of the, da, the thou shalt not. Right. Rule. Don't do this. Don't do that. And quite frankly, that's why I think is what well, ethics is so off-putting to so many people because it's punitive. Don't do this. It's like somebody shaking their finger. Like, it, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is Bill Clinton, right? I did not have sexual relations with that woman. What was her name? <laughs> Miss Lewinsky, shaking his finger at us. Democrat or Republican, whoever you are, whatever you were doing at the time, you thought, here's a, the president shaking his finger at you, and you're thinking, this, I don't like this. I don't, I don't <laughs> like how this feels. So this whole approach to doing ethics, and specifically in terms of saying don't do this, don't do that, is why you and I have such a difficult job. Well, that's true. And, and, and I have to say this, Bruce, I, I, I believe, um, I'm, and I say this honestly to you, I, I believe your book is something that can truly bridge the gap and help change the perspective. Um, if you could take people in the, in the HR arena that are um, they use this word, and maybe it's unfair, but obsessed with the the rules and the guidelines and the, the 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 formality of the document. And if they spent their time working on what you have included in the content of your book, I can't help but believe that the rules would be innately followed naturally without having necessarily to say them all. Well, that's right. And, and there's so many situations where it's not clear what the rules are or how they apply. Right. But if you make it a habit of being honest, if you make it a habit of uh, keeping your promises the way an accountable person uh, is so inclined, 
so to suppose. If you make it a habit of treating people fairly, then you don't have to memorize the rules. You're already yeah. accustomed to reacting in an honest or fair way. Right. Now, in your book, the, the first chapter is honesty. The second is accountability. And, and I want to go to the second chapter for just a second, because one of the things that really strikes me is people, uh, it seems, tend to have a um, eh, significant enough problem with the idea of being accountable. Um, over your life experience, have you found that it's, um, has it changed? Are people more apt to want to be accountable, or are we in a society where things change so rapidly, uh, if we can avoid accountability and there's an app for being able to do that, we tend to follow <laughs> the um, uh, the app for non-accountability? Well, as Winston Churchill said, the price of greatness is responsibility. And I'm not sure human cha nature has changed much over uh, hundreds of years, that it, it's difficult to be accountable because what that means is that uh, that sometimes we have to admit that we've made a mistake and to take responsibility for those mistakes. I mean, n accountability doesn't apply to succeeding, right? Nobody has any problem right. claiming responsibility when you did something well. It's when we don't do something well, when we when we miss the mark. And perhaps so many leaders have a difficult time apologizing because it seems like a sign of weakness to say, I made a mistake, I was wrong please accept my apology. But in fact, that's a sign of strength. Wouldn't you agree? I would. Absolutely. So, the, But I think the, the contribution this chapter makes um, to the world of business is that um, we think of work ethic as being essentially a matter of psychology, right? People with a strong work ethic are highly motivated and people with a, a poor work ethic are lazy. But in fact, people with a strong work ethic are primarily above everything else are highly accountable. They take their promise to their clients and to, the, to their businesses seriously. So really a strong work ethic, the way I'm presenting it, is an issue of character. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Um, and this is absolutely something that can be learned, that can, that can be practiced, that can be taught. You, um, when when you look at accountability and you look at courage, I want to I want to raise an interesting question to you. Um, I tend to look at um, a lot of uh, personal behavior. What, what motivates a person to take action? Um, why does a person make you know choice A over choice B, and and how does that apply in life? And most of the time, you will uh, you'll tend to find that if there is an ethical breach in a company, as opposed to approaching the good side, approaching the bad, there is an ethical breach. More times than not, um, that's discovered because someone is willing to call attention to it. Yes. Um, right. Here's the challenge, Bruce. Um, it also is true. That the person that calls attention to it, I'm going to label a whistleblower. Now, you know, being a snitch, telling on somebody, being a whistleblower, all has negative connotations, yet that is the number one way accountability is actually maintained within organizations. Is someone saying, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. Yet, if you have the courage to do that, by nature, there tends to be negative consequences to the whistleblower. I would like to challenge the statement that you just made because I think it buys into the idea that ethics is primarily about punishing wrongdoers that, okay. we, that you and I really want to get away from. And that is the way to promote accountability is, yes, of course, having whistleblowers in place when something goes wrong. But what if we expanded our notion of what accountability really is? And said, so maybe the way to bring accountable people, to make sure that people uh, take their job seriously is to hire accountable people in the first place. And um, you're in South Carolina now. I remember several years ago, I was giving a talk at a pharmaceutical company in North Carolina, where, of course, many of them are in Research Triangle. Right. And the CEO and I were having lunch, and he asked me about, he said, look, I'm an ethical person. I take ethics seriously. How can I ensure that this is an ethical culture. And I didn't have to think more than a second to respond. And my response, in fact, I think actually that's the genesis of this book. I responded by saying, you have to begin at the interview. Right. That's, where the, that's where it all starts. And so 
what I've been doing over the last two years is designing questions that interviewers can ask to increase the likelihood that the people they hire do take accountability seriously, are honest people, have been courageous, have stood up to bullies or corrupt vendors, are grateful and humble people. And conversely, if you're looking for a job, a great way to put yourself ahead of the pack is to emphasize how honest your honesty and your gratefulness and your fairness, your commitment to being courageous has delivered results for the places where you've worked before. So it's by talking about character in the interview that the process begins, not, you know, once, you're, not once you're in the company already. Right. You know, I think that's fascinating. And Bruce, and one of the things that I noted just as the as, as the book began is what you just said, uh, focusing on the concept of making sure the people you hire are of high character to begin with. Yes. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. My guest is Bruce Weinstein. He is the author of The Good Ones, 10 Crucial Qualities of High Character Employees. And I strongly urge you to get the book. In fact, I would encourage you, especially if you're in the HR segment of the business or you're in the hiring segment of the business, to pick up a copy of that because the questions that are included in the book really make for some interesting uh, interview questions. We're going to be back after this short break, and we'll talk about more of those 10 crucial qualities and perhaps hear a few stories from Bruce. So here's a question. Are you honest? Do you have courage? Are you fair? Are you grateful? Are you loyal? I'm asking a series of questions using certain words that are the, the crucial content to a brand new book entitled The Good Ones by Bruce Weinstein, 10 Crucial Qualities of High Character Employees. And, and I have to say, this is an outstanding book. Uh, Bruce was kind enough to interview me and include a, a, a short story in the book, and, and I am appreciative of having the opportunity to be a part of it. But Bruce, you've had so many stories in the book and so many wonderful interviews and have woven them together well. Uh, anyone that is looking to hire great, high-character employees should pick up a copy of this book. And this is the inaugural week for it, so there's not a better time than to pick up a <laughs> copy right now. Bruce, in the very first chapter, you talk about honesty, and if you would, share a little bit about the story that um, makes that work. There's a woman named Brenda Harry who until recently was a minimum wage job uh, clothes processor at a Goodwill store and donation center in Parisburg, Virginia. Now, Parisburg is a population of 2,786 people, and uh, she had worked in a furniture factory in town for decades until the factory closed and um, found a job processing clothes at Goodwill. And she was last January, she was going through uh, a jacket that had been dropped off and she found $3,100 in cash in a wow. coat pocket. And what do you think she did with it? I, well, I've read the chapter, so <laughs> that's that's not a fair question for me. So I'll let you go ahead. Had and you not it. read it, what would you have guessed? <laughs> you know, <laughs> th 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 that's a that's a great question. Had I not read it, there really would be two options. One is you stick it in your pocket, shut your mouth, and be done with it. Or the other, which I honestly believe most people would do, is turn it into the manager and let's see if we can find the person who turned the coat in. You know, it's really hard to know how most people would react because people who would, in fact, keep it probably would not disclose that fact. Absolutely. You're right. They would never disclose it. And also, you know, I did mention she's a minimum wage uh, worker. So this is Absolutely. more than two months of her take home pay. Right. Absolutely. But, um, her the uh, I was speaking with the, I learned about this when I was interviewing the um head of uh, compliance at, at the Goodwill uh, branch of stores in Virginia. And uh, Deb Saunders just mentioned this offhandedly. And I said, wait a minute, I have, 
this woman turned the money in, I have to find out. I'd like to talk with her and ask her why. And so I interviewed her and she said, it's very simple. It didn't belong to me. And wow. I said, well, um, help me to understand though, how, how were you raised? Where did this come from? And she said, well, my parents told me that um, if you're an honest person, you will be rewarded on judgment day. And if you're dishonest, you will pay for it on judgment day. So I said, well, you must be a religious person then. And she said, uh, no, not really. And I said, um, I mean, do you go to church? Do you, do you attend a house of worship? No, this is just this is just how I was raised. And in fact, when she was a, a young woman, something similar happened when she was at a drive in and uh, a, a sailor, uh, someone in the military was using a phone booth out at, in the parking lot at a drive in and he left. And um, Brenda noticed that he left his wallet that had all of his uh, papers that were necessary for him uh, to, to leave the country to go off to war. And so Brenda brought the wallet home and her mom said, you have to turn this in. And they did and got a lovely thank you note. And in fact, I think the, the soldier's mother sent uh, $10 as a thank you present. But the point is that Brenda was raised to do this. It, it'd be, it was part of her nature. It was part of her character. She was taught that this is an important thing to do. And that was just her reaction when it happened when she was in her early 60s. This is just something you do. You turn it in. And uh, I just find this such a touching story because it doesn't really matter how technically competent you are, or how much you know about marketing or sales or PR. Right. If you're fundamentally dishonest, why would anyone want to hire you? Right. And it, so, Chuck, it's just so strange to me that when you look at job descriptions in any area, sales, marketing, PR, whatever it happens to be, the ad almost inevitably focuses like a fetish on knowledge and skill, what you need to know and what you need to do. But job descriptions rarely, if ever, talk about character. Right. And yet, as we see, smart companies seek out people like Deborah Harry and they hire people like her. Bruce, um, I, I got a question for you. Um, some of these are a little off the wall, but um, but here you had an interview with this lady, and she said, well, you know, that's how I was raised. That's what my parents taught me. Uh, and I know that while both of us speak to associations and corporations around the country, we also speak to uh, students, uh, young people today. And so have you have you seen in your travels and, and, and in your speaking, have you seen a difference in the way youth are taught today as compared to the way this lady was taught so many years ago? Yes. And I'll tell you exactly how. And it's actually a story I tell in the book. I interview um, high school students for my college. Uh and uh, several years ago, I was interviewing someone who was clearly very bright, very gifted, really smart, went to one of the best schools in New York City. And I asked him offhandedly, you know, have you ever cheated? Oh, I think I mentioned that that I just written a book for teens called Is It Still Cheating If I Don't Get Caught? Right. Cute and title. he I said, like uh, yeah, my my friends and I cheat. And I said, excuse me? And he said, oh, yeah, I mean, you need to, to, to get by. I mean, if you want to get into a good school, everybody cheats. And I, I admired his honesty for telling me that. But I also said to the school, you should not admit this guy because uh, he may be really smart and he's obviously um, very talented in, in various fields, subjects. But, uh, I mean, he had straight A's. But he's a cheater. And he admits right. it and he had – not only does he admit it, he doesn't have a problem with it. Right. I mean, it's one thing. And look, I, I will be the first to admit, I think I actually talk about this in the book, too. It's, I'm sh ashamed of it, so I'm not sure I, I like to block that out. But um, I tried to cheat once in high school, <laughs> and, uh, and it, it, it still is so upsetting to me because it, I was cheating off of a friend of mine. And the look that he gave me, the look of betrayal that he gave me when he saw that I was trying to copy from his his paper – I mean, th now this happened, gosh, what was this, 1978, and I still am haunted by that look on his face, his face of, how dare you, I'm, I'm your friend, why would you do this to me? Right. So my point is that, look, we, we've all done things that we're ashamed of, and you know, you've 
this is the focal point of, of your talks in your book. Uh, but with this young fellow that I was uh, interviewing, he wasn't bothered by it. Right. That, to me, is the trouble. And I'm not saying that he represents all young people today, but that was just surprising to me that somebody so smart and in such a good school was so cavalier about it. That was new to me. Yeah, Bruce, and you know, the, the thing that I'm, I, I asked you the question, had no idea what your answer would be. I'm not surprised by the answer. I, um, I have to admit, I, I look at the idea of high character employees, and I look at the concepts, the, the, the 10 crucial qualities that you have, and I agree with those qualities. I just have this, and I use the word fear, and that may not be the right word, but it's the one that comes to me, that um, today that's not something that's taught. Um, to, to, to the lady who found the $3,100 and turned it in, that's what she was taught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was uh, speaking to a, a group of young people, college group, and I said, uh, you know, how many on Facebook? Of course, everybody raised their hand. How many on LinkedIn? Substantially smaller number. How many on Snapchat? And most everyone raised their hand. And I said, I'm curious, tell me, you know, I'm an old guy. I kind of, <laughs> you know, rub my gray hair. I said, tell me, what's, what's the value of being on Snapchat? And they said, oh, well, you know, whatever you put on there, it disappears in 10 seconds. I said, so basically what you're saying is, is you want to be able to put something on that you don't want someone to see, and you know it's supposedly going to go away, so therefore it makes it okay to do something that you wouldn't otherwise want people to see. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole concept. And I'm like, so we've got an app that promotes less than high character. Well, and this, the, of course, the folly of all that is that it's possible to do a screen capture of those images or to use somebody else's phone to take a picture of it. Absolutely. So this idea that I, I am even capable of sending something that will disappear into the ether is a false one. Right. It doesn't Absolutely. happen. Right. So I, I don't, you know, we really have to act as though every email, every text, every photo that we post or send is something that could be discovered because it all is discoverable. Right. You know, it's interesting in your book because you're talking about high character employees. One of the comments that I made to this group, I said, well, let me ask you a quick question. Do you think that it is ethical for me to look at your Facebook page to make a hiring decision? And a good number of the students in this in this group said, no, we, we don't think that's ethical at all. And um and I kind of laughed and I said, well, I'm not the person that's going to say it is or isn't ethical. I'm going to tell you it will happen. Yes. I am going to look at or in any employer is going to look at your Facebook page. And if you've got your drunken pictures, whenever you were at whatever it happened to be plastered all over it, and I'm hiring you for a uh, let's say it's a financial services job, since that's the background that I come from, and I need you to be competent and confidential, I'm probably not going to make the choice because when you're inebriated, you're likely going to lose your competence and your confidence, at least in terms of my business. And what does it say about your judgment that you're willing to put a picture like that online and also mention on your uh, about page or your bio page where you work? Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. The name of the book is The Good Ones. It is an outstanding read. You're very when we get back, you. oh, it's true. When we get back, we're going to talk about some of the questions that might be asked as we wrap things up. This is the um, uh, uh, coming out phase, so to speak, of this brand new book, uh, The Good Ones by Bruce Weinstein. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. Bruce is my guest. I am delighted to have him. He is the ethics guy and has made an incredible offer that if you send your uh, request to bruce at theethicsguy.com, he will send you an audio version of his book. Uh, stick wait, with wait, me. I, with, wait oh. I should just say, uh, it's not an audio version of this book. It's okay. a full-length audio seminar of my previous book, Ethical Intelligence. Okay, sorry. Thank just you. To clarify. Ethical, okay, very good. Ethical Intelligence. Bruce, thank you so much. Now, stick with us. We're going to be right back. We'll get into some questions and delve deeper into the good ones. This is Chuck Gallagher. My uh, 
uh, guest today is Bruce Weinstein. He is the ethics guy. Love the title. And he has written a brand new book called The Good Ones, 10 Crucial Qualities of High Character Employees. Uh, I have downloaded the book. I'm probably two-thirds of the way through it at this point in time. It is a masterfully written book and, uh, and a great book if you are in the process of expanding, growing, or hiring, and we all at some point in time are involved in the hiring process, and probably the crucial thing that takes place is making the right decision about the right person. <laughs> now, Bruce, I, th that is, of course, a lot of what this book is about. Talk to me, if you will, about... Um, some of those things that came out of your interviews that created some really interesting and cool questions that you feel make the interview process of finding those high character employees possible. Well, one of the people I had the privilege to interview is a fellow named Bill Treasurer, who wrote a book called Courage Goes to Work. And he was on the U.S. high diving team. So he knows a lot about fear and uh, overcoming fear. So he uh, suggested that I put the following question at the end of the book for interviewers to consider. Tell me about a time when a direct report pushed back on you and felt strongly about a position. What was the situation? What did they say and how did you react? So here you're called upon to talk about how the, the degree to which you are open to criticism. And it's the mark of a strong leader to not only tolerate criticism, but to welcome it, because that's how we get better. To encourage people to say, wait a minute, I, I really disagree with this, and I'll t and hear my reasons why. If you ignore a constructive criticism like that, we're, we're going uh, forward blindly and uh, are liable to make mistakes. So it takes a courageous person. It takes a person of high character to say, to a direct report, um, tell me how you really feel about this. And if you really don't like it, I want to know. Right. So I thought yeah. that was that was an interesting way of turning around uh, the, the question that is also worth asking uh, of, of a job applicant, namely, describe a time when you had to disagree with someone in authority and stand your ground. What was the situation? How did the other person react? What did you do? People have no problem really talking about when they had to stand up to authority because we all have a good David and Goliath story when we're the David, right? Right. When we're standing up to a bully or standing up to someone with more power than us because it makes us look great. But when we have more power to say that we welcomed criticism, we welcomed somebody saying, I don't agree with you, that takes a really strong person. Right. You know, it's interesting today in the interview world, uh, if you go to, you know, monster.com or career builder or a whole host of places that are on the internet, it's, it's kind of fascinating because they will give you the top interview questions to prepare for. And Bruce, what I found thus far in reading through the book, and I haven't gotten to that place, but what I have found thus far is some of these questions aren't going to be the types of questions that you're going to find on monster or career builder to prepare you for the interview, which is great. Actually, you just gave me a great idea, Chuck, because we have to make sure that Monster and what was the other career builder that you career mentioned mm -hmm. that they that they include these kinds of questions. Yep. And in fact, I'm now giving a talk called how to absolutely positively ace your job interview. And it's directed to people who are looking for jobs, but encouraging them to talk about their own high character and how their honesty and courage has delivered results for the places where they've worked in addition to talking about how knowledgeable and skilled they are, but to bring this to the table as well, their character. Right. You know, it's interesting, Bruce, um, you and I come from different worlds, and, and it's fascinating because both of, both of us speak to very similar groups. Um, you were horrified by the uh, the look on your uh, your friend's face when you considered the possibility of cheating. I, on the other hand, obviously cheated, um, maybe more than that, we'll call it, such that it ended me up in federal prison. I have found over time that in a job interview, um, the best thing that I can do is be very open, very quickly about what my past is. Mm -hmm. Because in reality, if the interviewer 
has a, um, a legal or predisposition to hiring someone who is a convicted felon, I would rather not waste their time, and I would rather them know I will be honest about what my past is and uh, give them then the, the, the opportunity to decide whether they want to consider that or not. And I get calls all the time from folks uh, uh, who have similar pasts saying, well, you know, what do I do and how do I put my life back together? And thus far, the best answer I can give them is be very transparent about what has taken place, because if someone cannot trust you, they can't trust your honesty, then then we'll never ultimately have a long-term hiring relationship or employment relationship. And if you hide your past, uh, eventually the past will come out, and then people will for sure not trust you. Well, I thought it was a sign of your own high character, quite frankly, that at the end of your talk, you said, um, I want you to feel free to ask me any question Whatever you want to ask me, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer. There's no question that's off limits. And so I, I, I thought, gosh, I've never heard anybody you know, who's been in prison uh, open themselves to that. So I'm wondering, um, what's the most common question you were asked in the Q&As that you do? You know, the funny part about that, 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 that's an interesting question. You're interviewing me. But the, the question that I typically get in the Q&As always deals with family. Uh, most of the time, what happened with your children? What happened with your wife? Uh, those are the common questions. Rarely, uh, you know, from time to time, people want to know about, well, what was the prison experience like? Or, you know, talk to us more about the crime or, or so forth. But most of the time, it's I want to know about the humanity of the experience. If mm -hmm. You do something wrong, and I say this in my talk, and you've heard this, you know, you may have made a mistake. You are not a mistake. Mm. And, uh, you, you know, it's kind of like saying another way of putting it is you could have screwed up, but that doesn't make you a screw up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there is such uh, moral value to looking at who we are as human beings far beyond the stupidity of choices that from time to time we might make. So you've never been asked a question that you felt like, well, no, that really, I can't really go there. No. Sure. I, I've learned I've learned one thing, Bruce, in, in my experience, and that is uh, the more transparent you are, the easier it is to function in life. Mm -hmm. um, my number one client outside of speaking, uh, I'm chief operating officer of a company in Greenville, South Carolina, and my number one client will not hire me as an employee because I'm a convicted felon. They do $100 million worth of business with our company but they won't hire me as an employee. Well, yes. I, I don't need them to hire me. I need them to understand that I bring value to their organization. And um, the fact that there may be some limitations is just a continued consequence and reminder of the importance of being high character. And this is why, in fact, that I list honesty is the first of the 10 qualities. The other nine are in alphabetical order, but honesty is number one because without honesty, it doesn't matter how courageous or grateful or humble you are. If you're fundamentally dishonest, no smart company would want to hire you or will keep you on for long once they discover that. Yeah, and, and that's interesting. I appreciate you just telling me that. I'm sitting here looking at the book, The Good Ones. Uh, my guest is Bruce Weinstein. And you said the first one is honesty. The rest are in alphabetical order. And I was getting ready to ask you the question, so are these in the order of importance? And you just answered it. No, they're just in yeah. alphabetical order. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to come up, and in fact, maybe if one of your listeners can help me come up with some kind of cool acronym that will you know, form a sentence or a, a word that encapsulates all of these 10, I couldn't come up with one. You know, every good boy de deserves favor for the, the, right. uh, the notes in the treble clef scale. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't think of that, so I just, I just list them. And in fact, um, it's kind of hard for me to, to reel them off off the top of my head, so I have the 10 posted right in front of me so that I don't hmm. forget them myself, even though I spent the last two years writing about them. But uh, they're, they're not intuitively obvious, I think, uh, other than honesty. Right. You wouldn't Bruce, think of gratitude. No, you wouldn't, but yet um, uh, gratitude is so critically important um, in the long-term experience of being a human being. And, um, and, and you know... 
Our jobs are part of who we are. It isn't the totality of who we are. So if we can bring who we are to our employment or the opportunity that we have to create value in life, um, I, I think that makes it incredible. Bruce, I, I have to tell you, we're, we have run out of time, and I really hate that. But I want to encourage the people who are listening. The book is titled The Good Ones. It's got a great cover. The author is Bruce Weinstein, 10 Crucial Qualities of High Character Employees. If you're in business, I'm going to call this one a must read because we all have the opportunity to interview people. And I think we would all agree if we can surround ourselves with high character employees, we know that our business is destined for success. Bruce, thank you for taking the time to write the book. And Gosh, thank you thank, for taking the time you, to be Chuck, on the for, show. For sitting for an hour and being interviewed all those months ago. And uh, here we are talking about the book in which uh, your story appears. Amazing. Well, I really do appreciate it. And again, I would encourage folks to go to amazon.com, look for the good ones, pick up your copy today. And, uh, and I promise you, it is well-written and a great read. Bruce, thanks for being on the show. And as I close every show with the statement, every choice we make in life has a consequence. Consider the choices you make wisely. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. Amen, brother. You've been listening to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. Tune in each week on TransformationTalkRadio.com each Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern as Chuck Gallagher, international speaker and author, cuts through the noise to share truth through transparency. Nationally known guests talk about what's important to you, your life, your concerns, and your success. Visit ChuckGallagher.com for more information and turn on to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher.